Today, I'm going to share with you how I make a living as a live audio engineer, how much I charge, what are some industry best practices, some of the nuances around how you measure your time, what invoicing looks like, what about travel. I'm going to dive into the nitty gritty of all that stuff, but also keep it quick and dirty. If you're new to the field or just trying to figure this out or just see how other people do this, I think a really helpful tool in general for to make sure you have your finances together is my freelance finance spreadsheet. I've got a link below. It can be found in my audio toolkit, or you can go to produced by mkc.com slash audio toolkit. And once you sign up for that and get that length, you scroll down a little bit. It's also got my audio math survival spreadsheet, one of my most popular tools if you're into system design. But you scroll down a little bit, click here on freelance finance, and you can look at a monthly uh, and yearly basis. Uh, how much do you want to make? Are you on track? Are you saying enough invoices? What are your expenses looking like? This is your financial health of your entire business on one spreadsheet. I think that'd be really helpful for you. We're not going to dive into all those formulas today. Today, we're just going to talk about how do you charge and what does that look like from a financial perspective when you're running your own freelance audio engineer business? If you're on staff somewhere, it's going to look different. You're, you're on payroll. They're going to pay you bi-weekly or monthly or something like that. So as a freelancer, what does that look like? So when I'm speaking from industry best practices, uh, I'll tell you my experience. I have not been on tour, so I really don't know how that works. I think it's still day rate oriented. Uh, I do 90% local shows and probably 10% travel. So most of this is local with a lot of similar production companies. And I usually work with uh, at least the past few years an average about five different production companies. And so it's not like it's just one all the time. Uh, so this, this, this can translate to not just one isolated workflow with a different company. And I have worked with over a dozen. It just right now, uh, five is my regular clientele. Okay, just to be really clear and start from the beginning, how do you make money as a live ed engineer? In short, you're exchanging your time and expertise for dollars. You're booked for a day rate. Since we are event-oriented as an industry and it's centered around a specific time, you need to be somewhere to accomplish a specific job. So you're trading time for dollars. So and this is usually billed in a full day, which is a 10-hour day for production. You know, most people work eight-hour days, but you need to be there before the event starts to make sure it's cool. Uh, if it's a show day and a little bit after help clean up. And so just 10 hour days is usually how things are blocked or for a half day. And that is a five hour block. So that is your usual rate. So it's like, Hey, can you be available for this event? Is this a full day or a half day? Um, and then that time is usually set up or split up into four different buckets. Is this set up for an event? Is this rehearsals for an event? Is this the actual show, the event in and of itself? And then there's strike or teardown. So you may be a part of just one of these phases or all four, depending on the show's scope. If there's this giant, you know, Infocom or whatever, big old giant show, they're loading into the arena for two weeks. They're doing rehearsals for a week. Then the shows, maybe three or four days, and then they have a three-day loadout to get everyone out of there. So depending on the show's scope, it's going to determine how much total time you can invest in a single event. But in general, it's great to get on shows that are multiple days, so you're not having to be so piecemeal and drive to different places all the time or have to learn uh, many different production companies' ways of doing things from hopping from show to show that, that wastes time and energy from context sw switching. So if you're able to get on shows that are multiple days of setup, rehearsal day, show day, and strike, that is really advantageous. So full day and half day. So what about overtime? What if you go over that 10 hour mark? Sometimes the, the that is up to the production manager. Usually what I do, if I am at the 10 hour mark and it was not originally slated for the workday in the hours they sent out ahead of time for us to be in overtime, I'll go, hey, I'm at my 10th hour. Do you want me to stay or not? And the production manager can make that decision. So most of the, engineer, engin, uh, the, most of the industry after that bills at time and a half per hour after the 10 hour mark. So the 11th and 12th and 13th hour uh, for you, I, I charge $500 for a day rate. So that basically is $50 an hour. Again, that's billed in a half day or full day block. That um, would start to be $75 an hour on the 11th, 12th, and 13th. And I usually, on the invoice, put that explicitly like, hey, I was booked for a full day, and then we also went into overtime, and this was included in the original scope or not. 
And so what about this also funny decision of like, what if you're booked for a half day and then you go into the sixth and seventh? Uh, most people say, if you keep me one minute over the five hour mark, then I am going to charge accordingly and go directly up to a full day because that is usually the, it's either a zero or one, it's full day or half day, right? For, for most, I usually, if something went wrong, I, I guess it's really up to you and your relationship with the company. Some people say, let's hard and fast just to keep it clean. And then, then the production manager, but it's also a good idea to go up to the PM just in case they're putting out a lot of fires and say like, Hey, I know we're only scheduled for the half day. It's about to be there. How would you like to handle this? So at the end of the day, just please keep open communication and a lot of things will be solved. I usually, it will go up to the end of the sixth hour. So if I was booked from noon to five, I would go to 6 p.m. And I, if I go past that six hour mark, I'll go ahead and charge for a full day. If it's just a little bit over the five hour mark to really just button stuff up, I will charge one additional hour on top of the half day of, of overtime. So it would be, uh, so a half day for me is 250. That additional hour, instead of just being another $50, it would be one hour of OT just to be like, hey, this wasn't expected. Because sometimes you really need to be somewhere after a half day uh, because I still have more hours to work. I need to work on a different project here in the studio or something like that. Uh, so it's it's not they're not just getting free lunch of like, oh, we can keep whenever you want. Because why this half day, full day system works is you've already said, here is my time, you can have it, and it's booked in advance. So when that gets screwy, um, I think you should be compensated for that. So what about cancellations? So most of the industry I've found, again, this is just my experience. So I would love for you to share yours if this is different with the companies that, that you work with. They have up to 20, if they can book, they can cancel a show 24 hours in advance with no repercussions. Because I mean, sometimes stuff gets rained out or, you know, there's a global pandemic and stuff gets moved a year and a half out, something like that. And so that is a 24 hour notice, which isn't a ton. You can, as a freelancer, again, it's up to you. You are your own business, can have have separate policies you set We say, hey, if you're working with me, I want a week's notice. If I don't have that, then I am due half the invoice of the labor I do or something like that. I know some freelancers who, uh, who end up doing that. I don't. It's just it, it's a 24-hour notice for me. And again, that's neither good or bad that I do the way I do or way that they, they do, but I just want you to know that it's fluid. So, but just know that sometimes things get canceled. More than that, though, people want events to happen. They want to be able to talk to the rest of their company or share with people or have a fun time. People want them to happen. So it's really not that often things get canceled. It's usually due to things outside of people's control. So go, to go back, while I was talking about a policy, all a policy is, is something I learned from Blair Enns, uh, who's a brilliant sales guy. He says a policy is a decision made in advance. So you can set those. So that kind of goes back to how are those usually negotiated? And that's usually within a contract. So you can send that over to a production company and say, hey, this is what it looks like to work with me. And most times if you're working with a new production company, establishing a new relationship, uh, they will also do the same with you to say, hey, as a freelancer, here's what it's like to work with us. And so you being able to reconcile those two things of like, here's what it's like to work with me. And they do that uh, and come to terms. And sometimes they're going to stay hard and fast. Like you have to check every single box on this thing or else we're not going to work together. And you just negotiate that. So don't be afraid to uh, really stick to your guns and say like, Hey, here's, here's what it means. I need a week's notice because I, this is my livelihood and I cannot have just a 24 hour advance notice or my day rate is this much. If I'm traveling, I actually charge more from traveling. I do 600 a day because to be away from my family, it's tiring to travel. Um, you need to uh, make it work for you. So these are just, again, my experiences and how I end up thinking about the industry. I don't know. I, I may end up charging more in the future for right now. This works. This is what the market here in Northwest Arkansas can handle. And when I'm traveling to DC or Miami or whatever to do a show is what makes sense. So, uh, so how do you bill for travel? So travel, how I do it is I usually do a flat half day if the travel is under five hours. So like, Hey, if it's a travel day, that's full day is 600. So a half day would be 300. So say, Hey, for me to travel anywhere, even if I'm just driving out of town, maybe to Joplin or Dallas or whatever, that's under the five hour mark for those. And that would be a flat half day. And then if I start working that day as, as well. So if I travel and work in the same day, my day rate then starts when I start working. Some people do it. If I travel, that's already in the half day. And if I work a half day, then go more, they would start charging overtime. I just start when I'm actually 
pushing cases and getting speakers in the air starts my time and go from there. So again, that's fluid. You can decide for yourself if that works. And so, and then if I'm traveling back, that's a flat half day. And the, if I work that day, let's say a full day, then I'll also have to travel on top of it. The clock stops when I push the last case on the truck and then just do a flat half day on top of that. If the travel is more than five hours total, I'll go ahead and charge a full day. Cause again, that's my time being, being taken there, but it's a, it's a useful unit to use. <clears throat> so kind of a logistical thing in the back end. Uh, most of the time I'm invoicing for the labor on the back end. If I'm traveling for a show that's booked way in advance and it's a larger company, most of the time they'll pay for hotel and plane tickets and that stuff in advance. But sometimes if stuff is super short notice, I have to eat that up front to invoice it on the back end. So, um, I, I work with a cash mentality. I don't have a credit card, so I'm usually able to front that and make it work. But, uh, if that's, you don't have, have much cash in reserve, it's probably a good idea to get a credit card that you are responsible with and don't get a Ferrari with and be able to charge for that travel stuff um, on the front end and then invoice for it later. Again, that could be a policy that you have as a freelancer is like all travel and all you know expenses that I would have to be, uh, incur need to be paid in full upfront for their estimated cost. So you know you're going to stay in a hotel for four nights. It's 200 bucks a night. So that's 800. You get a $500 plane ticket. That means they're paying you $1,300 up front uh, to make sure that's already covered if you end up having to do it. Because so, sometimes they don't want to deal with the logistics, having to call a hotel. They just say, here's the money, you figure it out. Then you book your own hotel, you book your own flight. Uh, and most of the time, they're going to want you to fly economy, not first class, so be careful there. <laughs> so don't don't charge a huge amount of money for all that. And then on the back end on the invoices, I make separate line items for my labor, my travel, then all my other expenses that I had to pay for airport parking for the airport ticket um, and make sure that's all separated out and not just big in one giant number because they're going to have to do some accounting to say, here's what we paid in labor. Here's what we paid in travel. And that's good for you to have on your back end as well because travel costs that you incur for the client. So you could be there for a show is called a cog that's cost of goods sold. Sometimes it's really nice to send a huge invoice, you know, a $6,000 invoice. If you travel to Vegas for a week and did a show, but if you were five days gone and your travel day rate's 600, that's $3,000, excuse me, in actual revenue that you, you fees for what you build. But if you send a total of a $6,000 invoice because you had a last minute plane ticket and the hotel is expensive, that's $3,000 in COG. So you didn't actually make money. It's just a pass through. It's you just build for your travel and then uh, the client's going to pay, pay you back for that. So again, it feels nice to send these big fat invoices, but that's why in my freelance finance spreadsheet, I have a separate line item for COG. So you can really make sure like, Hey, how much money am I actually making from my labor? Not just this, this big shiny invoice that looks big just because it has a bunch of travel costs that actually don't make me money on it. So lastly, can you, can you, what does it look like to make enough money as an audio freelancer? Is this a, something you make a living out of? So the simple math is if you have four full days a week, so four out of the seven days uh, at, at a full day, 50 weeks out of the year, that's $100,000. Let me do that math right here. So that's four days a week times 500 a day, that's $2,000 a week, times 50 weeks of the year, $100,000. I think that's a pretty good living if you're billing for that. So again, you are capped at that because we are again trading time for dollars. And so you can find out other ways to scale yourself via consulting in live audio or doing another skill set that isn't time for dollars. But again, if you're just mixing for a show, that's how you're billing and that's how it works. So bill for your travel, make sure you keep track of all that so you can send a nice clean invoice to the client. But that is how you make money and bill for it in the live audio industry. Again, if you need help with all this, keeping track of your money, and this is confusing, please make sure and get my freelance finance spreadsheet found in my audio toolkit. That is at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It is stuff full of a bunch of other great stuff for you. That is how I bill for my services in the audio industry. Appreciate you watching and I'll catch you on the next video.